Please rise uh, for an invocation followed by flight to sleep. Lord, we ask you to bless the city, its citizens, and its visitors in this uh, period of, uh, of uh, transition and, and relative uncertainty. Bless those of, uh, who, of us who have been chosen to lead uh, in the city and, and help us to make uh, decisions that are thoughtful and professional and farsighted. Um, we seek to continue to make Williamsport a healthy and a safe and a prosperous place to live and work and play. Um, protect those who protect us here at home, across this nation, and abroad. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and welcome to the City Council meeting. Uh, it's Thursday, February 2nd. Um, uh, we have a relatively manageable uh, agenda this evening, so I hope you all enjoy it. Um, the next item on our agenda is approval of City Council meeting minutes dated uh, January 19th, 2017. Um, can I have a motion and a second to approve those? So moved. Second. Here, a motion and a second. Any comments or questions from members of council? Hearing none, uh, Mrs. Frank, uh, on approval of the minutes. Ms. Neely. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes. Uh, and those minutes are approved, and, and yes, Ms. Neely, we are in the dark this evening. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that will cost us money, uh, unfortunately. Um, next item on the floor is the limited courtesy of the floor. We've had no request for that this evening, so we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is appointments. Um, we have several appointments, uh, and I think, Mr. Mayor Wright, the first ones since uh, 2004 to our tax appeals board. Um, and I think Mr. Grimes will help the mayor uh, in uh, helping us understand that. How are you this evening? Great, Dr. President, members of City Council, Mr. Vice President, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address an issue. There has been a long hiatus in regards to the Tax Appeals Board, and by speaking to the Treasurer, we feel that this is a board uh, that is needed, and we have uh, included three individuals here tonight that would like to participate in the process, and I'm sure that they will do a wonderful job. Thank you. Treasurer. Um, the only thing I have to add to that is there is a need for it, and it's been a board that hasn't been um, filled for quite some time. And the requirements to fill the board are you need to have two residents, and then you need to have a CPA on the board. Um, there are, is also three alternate positions available. Um, we're going to take a little longer to fill those positions as we get to look through some more candidates that are willing to serve on the board. One of the alternates also needs to be a CPA. Um, and we've gotten some very good names for this, and this was reviewed by finance. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, the three names, uh, just for the record, are Andre Phillips, Heather Demshock, and Sherry Girardi. Um, uh, Ms. Mealy from finance. Uh, uh, just for the public's uh, awareness, um, Council's instituted a new procedure for uh, appointments and reappointments, and that is uh, to ask uh, individuals to be appointed or uh, reappointed to boards and commissions to attend, uh, depending on the topic, uh, council uh, committee meetings, um, to allow for uh, 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 a more uh, conversation in terms of interchange of ideas about um, the, the future of the city and, and the jurisdiction of the board and, and how we might proceed. And so uh, this is the first time that's happening. And so in terms of that procedure, my question to the finance committee is, um, was it simply a conversation or did you also include recommendations as we do it on a resolution or ordinance? Well, um, this being the first time that this had ever happened in the Finance Committee, um, I, I won't guarantee we were as, uh, we, we, we were perhaps as thorough as we may be in the future. <laughs> and especially given that um, none of us, frankly, has any experience with this particular board since we haven't had one since 2004. <laughs> but, um, but we did uh, we did make a positive recommendation to the full body of council, um, and uh, and we were fortunate to 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 get to meet the members the the, the soon to be members of the tax appeals board. I'm I'm assuming, um, and. Uh, 
Ms. Phillips in particular, Andre Phillips, um, uh, had served on the board previously, um, and I, I believe um, simply for lack of a reappointment is, is not currently on the board <laughs> effectively. Um, so, uh, um, you know, we did, we did um, meet Andre Phillips and Jerry Girardi because of the swiftness with which this particular board needs to be appointed. Um, Ms. Demchak was not able to make our um, finance meeting on Tuesday, but, um, but uh, she is the, the CPA that's required for the, um, for the committee. And um, all in all, we were impressed. Um, we, uh, Ms. Phillips claimed to not have a great recollection of the meetings, but she will be the only one with experience. So, <laughs> um, so we asked her to, uh, to do her best to oversee proceedings at our first, at our first meeting. Um, okay, and that was everything. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, comments or questions about the appointments from members of council? Mr. Allison. Um, we, we need the, uh, the appeals board because we have a pending appeal. And, um, but I, I just wanted to make the point, um, they're probably, uh, there's probably a chance they're going to be more active because um, of the great job that our treasurer's doing, uh, Nick Grimes, in, in identifying um, different entities that in the past haven't been, uh, they've flown under the radar or different um, uh, jobs where everyone wasn't identified that or every corporation or whatever um, contractor was not identified so um, he's doing a good job so you know we may run into more appeals uh, which is part of the process you know everybody gets a fair hearing um, as a citizen or, or an entity so um, we, we have good people in place so other comments or questions? Mrs. Katz. I just think it was great to, to meet the people that are going to be serving on, on our committees um, to introduce ourselves as well as they introduce mm -hmm. us. So uh, to have that opportunity, um, I think it makes everybody feel that they're part of a, a, a group instead of they're just out there somewhere and, and we're here. And uh, the conversation was really good and mm -hmm. we know um, these are good people. Mm -hmm. And it was it was it was really great to just sit there and uh, talk with them great. and find out a little bit about them. So Nick did a good job with this. Well, thank you to finance for uh, taking our first steps in, in this new initiative. I think it'll be good uh, to enhance the communications uh, across the various entities in the city. Um, and uh, I would also say uh, to, reiter to build on what Mr. Allison said for uh, our city treasurer, Mr. Grimes, um, the proactive pursuit of, of revenue um, from people who owe it um, is something that benefits all of the taxpayers of the city because it, it makes sure that people are paying their fair share, um, which then helps us uh, uh, it, have a, a budget that's workable and limiting our need to, to place larger and larger burdens on other uh, of the existing taxpayers that pay what they should year in and year out. Um, but also, um, I think you're right, due process mm -hmm. uh, under the law is uh, absolutely part of what this appeals board is all about. And, um, and so it is the right thing to do. Um, both because we have to, um, but also because of, of our long-standing American traditions. Um, if there are no other comments or questions, uh, then Mrs. Frank on uh, the appointments to the Tax Appeals Board, please. Ms. Neely. Yes. Mr. Nobiello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and, and those appointments are approved. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, I'm going to jump around a little bit because uh, of guests that we have here. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Narr, uh, should we move down to your item next? Uh, so the next item on the agenda will be the resolution, I'm sorry, uh, lot consolidation uh, for 2328 Fairview Terrace. Mr. Narr, how are you this evening? Good evening, President and members of City Council. What I present to you this evening is a two-lot consolidation a request from David and Kelly Servinsky the current use of the property is a vacant lot the proposed use will be a garage it is in the R2 zoning districts the county reviewed this back in November 18th and you have been provided their comments since November 18th they've modified it from a three lot subdivision 
to a two lot lot consolidation. The two lots north of the on your on your drawings, the two lots north of the alley are actually what's going to be consolidated, and that is a requirement for them to put the garage there. They will not be consolidating the third parcel, which is where the resident sits on the south side of the property. So county did make those comments back in November. Since then, it has been modified. It has been reviewed by our planning commission and gave positive recommendation, and I do have a representative here. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the lot consolidation, please? So second. Carry a motion and a second. Comments or questions? Ms. Mealy? Just a quick question about process. Um, we're not required to have county review this item again if, if it's modified before it comes Count, for a final vote. What we did was, is once we saw county's review, we went back and spoke with county. Then we went back to the owner, and at that point, we went back to the, the surveyor. They re did the two lot consolidation. I had talked to county. They're just not going to send out another letter, just okay. basic, because it was a simple lot consolidation. That makes perfect sense. I just wanted to make sure we weren't yep. going to be in violation of something or no. other. If we were to, okay. Other comments or questions? Just, Mr. Allison. Uh, in the middle of that number one uh, from the county uh, planning, it says. Uh, as a policy, a parcel cannot be combined with another parcel that will not be contagious. I think that I think should that's be contiguous. contiguous. Yeah. Contiguous, yes. I, I think that it shouldn't be contagious either. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that one. <laughs> Is that everything? That's it. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank, please. Ms. Mealy. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williams. Yes, and the uh, lot consolidation is approved. Thank you for uh, coming, uh, Mr. Servinsky. Um, next uh, item on uh, the agenda is certificate of appropriateness, Mr. Chardy. Um, uh, first of which is for 161 West Third Street. Good evening, President Williamson, members of council. Good evening. Uh, what you have before you is a request certificate appropriate request for 161 West Third Street. Owner is Mr. Reeder Travis. Uh, the uh, certificate appropriate request is to erect a wall-mounted externally illuminated sign to be located um, along Williams Street. The building's on the corner of Williams and Third. Um, the sign will have lights that are mounted on the wall shining down on it. It would be a wood or it would be a carved engraved sign, um, gold inlay. Um, the attorneys will inlay with white. The sign's approximately 48 inches tall by 90 inches wide, um, and uh, we do have representation here if you wish to ask any questions of the sign. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion and a second to approve the certificate of appropriateness? So moved. Very motion and a second. Comments or questions? Um, I have one question. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, this uh, particular property has had at least one and maybe a, another certificate appropriateness granted for signage in prior years. Um, I guess it's a two-piece question. Do those expire if they're not utilized, i.e. the signage did not go up? Yeah, and then would this supersede prior uh, approval given it's a different kind of signage? Or could they theoretically put up this sign and every other sign that's been approved simultaneously? It, it, from my understanding, a certificate of purpose doesn't go away. It stays with the property or the parcel of ground if it was approved. There's no ending date like we do with HARB. Six months, you don't get approved. You don't do your work. You go back through an approval. Right. Um, he also has to meet the zoning requirements. It's a corner lot, so I'm assuming two signs are permitted on that. So that's all he could ever put up. So if he had four signs approved, he can only ever put up one more sign. Okay. All right. That, that helps to solve this issue because yeah. I remember there was some signage and there was also, I think, some, seems like neon lighting yeah, and... Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, it was never, ever erected. And, uh, well, I mean, I'm not talking about this property in, in particular, but the idea that it would never expire could theoretically let someone really jazz up the place all right. at once if right. uh, they so chose. I mean, that's how I interpret the ordinance. Uh, Mr. Smith, maybe Dave might be able to help you out a little bit differently, but I think it's just, no, it's ongoing. I, I, I think you're correct, but I also think you're, uh, you're correct in terms of it's limited by the zoning ability. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and that helps deal with 
prevent that eventuality. So thank you for the general question there. Uh, any other comments or questions, Ms. Mina? Um, does the certificate, not to do with this particular case, but does the certificate of appropriateness continue with the property if the property changes hands? I would say no. Okay. Because the person who had that sign up who wants to erect a sign normally has his name on it. It advertised his business. Most, most of the time it's going to change from one business to another. So that I'm just thinking in terms of if somebody applied to paint a property or something like that and then sold the property, would the new person still be able to paint the colors that were approved without I would say if the colors were approved, yes, they would be permitted to paint it that color. Okay. Yes. Um, Again, I'll refer to our attorney on that, but I believe that's correct. I think the answer is it, it runs with the, with property, the property once granted. As a practical matter, the sign probably right. is going to change, but color right. combinations. Or something like that. I'm, I'm just thinking windows, color, or anything, you know, like, like, like that would continue with the property. Um, in your opinion, um, we've been talking for a long time about modifying this particular ordinance. We haven't gotten there. Um, but, Mr. Smith, might it be wise for us to put some sort of end date on certificates of appropriateness? I know demolition permits expire after a certain time period. Generally speaking, zoning uses continue, but licenses, for example, mm -hmm building permit, they expire. So this is kind of a hybrid. It's between the two, and it really depends on what council's desires might be. If they okay. do not want either the certificate of uh, convenience or appropriateness to continue uh, or to be attached to the land, then they should articulate that in, in their uh, ordinances. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't have a strong opinion. I'm just, just something to think about. It never, frankly, occurred to me. So. Okay. Sure. Okay, thank you. Other comments or questions? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Novello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and the uh, certificate is approved. Next time on the agenda is Certificate of Appropriateness for 201 Basin Street. Mr. Girardi. Yes. Uh, the owner of this um, particular tenant or the tenant of this particular space wishes to erect a wall-mounted externally illuminated sign um, it's a two foot by 14 foot long sign I have pictures of the actual wordage of the sign what it says also the location of the sign would be you see the, the blank facade on that picture I have that's where the sign's going to go and it's made of Omega bond which is mega board excuse me which is basically a metal panel that's in, encased with plastic very similar to most of the signs that are going up now and consistent with yes. the signs uh, that, on that strong. That's correct. Um, uh, motion and a second to approve the certificate. So move. Second. Hear a motion and a second. Comments or questions? Ms. Mealy? Uh, just a, one question um, unrelated to the certificate of appropriateness, but about the business itself. What is William Sport Escapes? We have a representative here, Jeremy. We wish he comes up. Uh, you, you're going to have to go. Sorry. For the, <laughs> for the microphone, if you would. <laughs> yes. Your name and affiliation for the record, and then. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Mitchell. Uh, I'm the owner of the business. Uh, I guess the business would be categorized under recreation. It's an escape room. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar? I think I might be, but could you explain a little further? Um, it's basically a game. You get locked in the room for one hour and have to solve puzzles to find your way out. Okay. Yeah, I've oh, seen something similar else, elsewhere. Yeah, okay. I've never, I've never experienced one, so. There's one in Lewisburg and one in Bloomsburg right now. I think they're the closest. And are they popular, I'm assuming, in those um, locations? Yeah. Okay. W what gave you this idea? Sorry. I'm uh, done several of them myself with my wife, okay. and uh, we loved it, so she wanted to open one. Okay. And now we're going to give it a shot. Sounds interesting. All right. Thank you. The, aren't you glad I asked? I am. <laughs> In fact, I, we had, we should, people know as readers Travis, but uh, sometimes when we do these certificates, it's nice to be able to give a little bit of free advertising for new businesses in the community. Uh, here's my question for you, though. Um, I can imagine all kinds of opportunities for buying, oh, a gift certificate for use at the time I choose for other people to do, use the escape room. <laughs> Is that a possibility? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, all the, all the booking would be done online. So okay. if you want to give a gift certificate, it would have a code, and they would just go to the website. And, and you could pick them up for us and put them in the room for us. Uh, <laughs> you're, ne you're never actually locked in the room. Oh, so, okay. I'm sure uh, that would be against fire codes. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a code violation. <laughs> Technicalities. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and, you. and good luck for your business. Thank you. Ms. Katz. Is it open yet? No. Is, it's not, March when is it opening? Is. When, it, when? March 1st, March hopefully. 1st. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, uh, Mrs. Frank, please. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and that certificate is approved. Uh, next item on the agenda is a certificate of appropriateness for 400 Market Street, Mr. Girardi. Yes. Uh, the last request is to erect another wall-mounted non-illuminated sign, signed to have individuals' letters made of bent metal with plastic letters installed into actual metal. Okay. Like channel? Yes, like a channel, yep. Um, I have attached photos of what the sign is going to look like and what it's going to look like erected onto the building. And we do have a representative here if you have any questions of him or myself. Thank you. Uh, motion and a second to approve the certificate. So move. Second. Very motion and a second. Comments or questions? Ms. Meehan. Um, just a quick question about how, how much of that is going to be mounted on the wall? Um, just the Firestone building or all the wording below it as well? I believe you'll see everything that's on that picture will be what's going to be mounted okay. on the wall. Aside from the dimensions, obviously. But, okay, so all the... Yes. Uh, interesting. A full circle of home services by local companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Uh, and this is the second element of signage for this, or I guess you get no, three, it's right? No, there's actually three signs presently on the building, if I'm right, correct, right? There's three signs on the building. He's permitted to have three on the building. So what he is going to do is he, this one will be mounted on the corner, mm -hmm. and the one at the very, very far end coming down 4th Street will be removed. So he'll be within zoning requirements of having three signs. You already approved two of them, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Yep. All right. Excellent. Other comments? Very Ms. Yeah. Mr. Allison. Very nice looking sign, mm -hmm. I think, to uh, harken back to what a lot of us remembered back in the day as the uh, Firestone tire. Mm -hmm. All three are remember that. Sign, yeah. Actually. Absolutely. It's, no other comments? Ms. Frank. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes. Uh, and that certificate is also approved. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for attending. Um, I'm going to head up to uh, number seven, resolution amending resolution 8625. Hmm? Um, Mrs. Frank, please. Resolution amending resolution 8625 for disposition of specific records. Should Thank you. Could I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So move. Second. Second. Um, and just a note, uh, this didn't go to a committee. This is uh, uh, correcting uh, an error from two weeks ago, and, and I'll let uh, uh, our controller, Ms. Woodring, uh, add any explanation that she'd like. Okay. Good evening, President Men members of Council. I'm requesting your authorization to amend resolution number 8625 concerning the disposal of municipal records. Changes to the, res uh, the resolution are as follows. Bank statements, years 2001 to 2009. Payroll checks, years 1999 to 2009. And general fund, liquid fuels, CDBG, treasury, home, and utility check, uh, years 1999 to 2009. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions? 19, I'm sorry, 1998. Thank you. Um, uh, comments or questions from members of council? Just to clean up uh, resolution is really all this is. Mr. That's what I, about, I was about to say. This is pretty much a standard procedure at this point in time to, uh, number one, give us some space down there, mm -hmm. and as well, just get unnecessary records off the, uh, yes. off the listings now, too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank, please. Ms. Mealy. Uh, yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. 
Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes. Uh, and that item, the resolution is approved. Um, now, uh, I think we're going to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to return to the regular order uh, for the remainder of the meeting. Um, so we'll uh, go to ordinance and final reading uh, related to the residency requirement. Uh, Ms. Frank, in short form, please. An ordinance, an ordinance amending Article 149.09, residency requirements. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second for this ordinance and final reading? So move. Second. Hearing motion and a second. Mr. Nichols, how are you this evening? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm pretty good, pretty good actually. How are you? I'm fine too. <laughs> That's <laughs> good. <laughs> thank you, uh, President Williamson, Vice President Alice, and members of council. The last meeting, which I <clears throat> didn't, was not able to attend, the ordinance was presented by the solicitor and there was uh, extensive debate, but it was approved on first reading. Uh, reviewing the discussion from the last meeting and also uh, the discussion that was held at the finance committee uh, meeting this week, um, there appears to be three different options under consideration on second reading. First uh, option would be to approve the ordinance before you on second reading, uh, or a second option that we consider additional amendments to this ordinance, including one to totally eliminate uh, the residency requirement. Or a third option to exclude the HR position from the residency requirement for a certain time frame, such as one year, so that uh, the administration can be assured that someone is anchored in the position and would not be subject to the ordinance during that person's tenure with the city, or just make a permit exclusion for that position and then um, recommend it to maybe uh, have an ad hoc committee look at any additional changes to the ordinance uh, going forward. So with that said, um, uh, the um, Finance Committee, I guess, uh, didn't really have a recommendation to the full body of council. So with that, I'll defer back to the chair for guidance on how you want to address this on second reading. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. And, and we did ask uh, Finance to, to take this up again. And, and I think they had a good discussion. Um, uh, and so we'll take it up from that discussion uh, after uh, a report. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, finance did indeed have a good discussion um, and still brings it back to the full body of council with no recommendation. Um, in, the, uh, in the interim two weeks, I did have an opportunity to sit down with um, our, uh, our other city solicitor, Norm Lubin, um, and, uh, and get his recommendation, sort of, sort of look at the um, recommendations of the administration on modifications of the ordinance um, and speak a little bit about some of council's um, goals and uh, and as as they seem to be understood both from the last meeting and from some emails that have been exchanged in the meantime, uh, he and I had arrived at two possible um, approaches for the time being. Um, one of which was to repeal the residency ordinance in its entirety. Um, that sounds drastic and. In some ways, it is. Of course, it's, it's a relatively small impact on the city. There, it only covers about 12 or 15 employees to begin with. Um, and we were always allowing them under our existing ordinance, allow, allowing those employees to live um, up to five miles outside of the city. So um, it, it, it's not a huge impact um, necessarily, but, but we could repeal the ordinance in its entirety, more or less see how things work with no residency requirement, um, how we feel about it. And then, of course, we always have the option to reinstitute. We or, or a future council would have the option to reinstitute a residency requirement if they felt that at the time that it was um, a wise idea. Um, the, uh, the other alternative that Solicitor Lubin and I had um, examined was um, to, to repeal, what, excuse me, to remove all of the positions um, that are required to have city residency from the ordinance with the exception of the three, um, of the, the Director of Administration, the Director of Public Safety, and the Director of Community Development, our three department heads within the city. Um, only one of those department positions is currently filled. So that leaves only Mr. Grado <laughs> being required to reside in this city. But <laughs> um, the mayor, um, I, I believe, is currently the acting director of public safety, and there is no director of administration. So, um, but uh, th those were the two sort of suggested paths by um, Mr. Lubin, and uh, those were 
based on a small amount of research into um, approaches that other communities took. And uh, it seems as though while the approaches other communities take run the gamut, um, there are a number of very successful communities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that do not have successful third class cities that do not have a residency requirement. Um, so, um, however, to continue further in this vein, um, during the finance meeting, one third um, possibility did, did surface. We did come up with one, one um, you know, a third idea that basically allows us to this evening appoint an ad hoc committee if we'd like to, to look into the, the residency um, issue further while um, providing, while either removing the position of um, human resources from this ordinance, from the, our old ordinance, or um, removing it just for the period of a year, and then it would be reinstated if there was a new if um, if we made a new hire in HR moving forward. Um, all of those things said, my final observation would be that uh, um, while I heard from a number of members of council via email in the in the intervening two weeks between now and the last council meeting, that they thought it might be wisest to, to move forward and just you know, eliminate or drastically reduce our existing residency ordinance. There was still concern from everyone, it seemed, um, that residency in the city be a, um, a positive criteria for employment, that is to say, be a weighted criteria for employment. Um, and I should point out that there isn't any way accepting a residency ordinance for us to ensure that that does happen. Do you know what I, do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Um, y you know, obviously the, the mayor says that it's an important part to him of the hiring process as well, but the residency ordinance is the only sort of law and order fa way for us to make sure that it, that, it, that, it is a, that it is a criteria of hiring. So. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a thought without getting back into the, the basic debate, and, and it might end up in, in a question on the solicitor. Um, the, the, an idea that um, in some ways a residency requirement is not a restriction on the employee, it's a restriction on the hiring entity. Um, in the, most cases that's really uh, the mayor. Um, in some, some cases that's council or at least it requires uh, some approval by council to allow the mayor who does most of the hiring to exempt or to change the requirement. Um, and so the difference between requiring whoever does the hiring, whether it's the mayor or it's the treasurer or it's the controller or it's council, um, requiring them to do it is one solution. A another solution that I think is acceptable is to have the hiring entity, the hiring individual, make that a part of the evaluation process voluntarily to that, the mayor or, or uh, the treasurer, et cetera. In other words, I can look at a list of applicants and say, hey, these people have a variety of qualifications that make them more or less desirable. And one of the things I really like about this particular applicant is not only are they qualified in lots of aspects of the job, but they also live in the city. Um, Give, have, allowing the mayor or whoever is hiring that discretion is permittable. Is that correct? Yes, it's not facially discriminatory. It doesn't exclude or include certain classes other than the fact of residency. So that would be an appropriate hiring consideration. Okay. And, and the reason. Perhaps even the job posting could say city residents. Preferred or, yes. yeah. Um, and the reason I bring that up tonight is because we had a good long discussion about one's ability to use that as a criteria of an employment last time. And, and um, given that uh, it would be allowable, really then that gives more discretion to the mayor, gives more discretion to council or the treasurer or the controller. I think those are the only people that would be hiring these positions. Um, to make that a decision. If, if the mayor sees a pool of, of candidates, of qualified candidates, then um, clearly we all, there is no disagreement that living in the city is a desirable thing for employees of the city. The question is, what does the pool look like? Will people even apply for the job if they know that they would have to live in the city um, or move, uproot their family and move into the city? Well, that would be great. We get everybody to live in the city. Um, it's not practical um, in, in some cases. And so um, 
I, I thought I'd throw it out, out there. I think I tend to side on the less residency requirement side of things, as, as I pointed out why last time. But um, I just wanted to kind of clarify that as uh, that the, the requirement itself is more of a restriction on who does the hiring than it is on the candidate um, in, in many respects. So eliminating it then would allow for greater latitude in choosing um, the most qualified individuals. Um, uh, comments or questions? Mr. Novia. I'm going to agree with that. My thought is, is that the, the more we can expand our potential candidate pool, uh, the better off we're going to be. It gives us more options and more opportunities to vet people that uh, are willing to provide some time and service to the city. Uh, the only other thought I would have would be something along the lines of those who are maybe would be considered uh, on 24-hour call for emergency mm -hmm. situations. Uh, beyond that, I would have no problem with no residency clause at all. Other comments or questions? Mrs. Katz. I have a problem with this. From the standpoint, this is how we came to Williamsport. We came to Williamsport because of a job offer from my husband. And uh, we had to uproot ourselves from where we were. Um, we fell in love with the city, and we've been here for a good many years. And I feel, you know, my, my statement with this is to work, live, and shop in our beautiful city. Mm -hmm. um, this, this position that we're going to probably, we are going to give a waiver for, is a good salary. It's a $52,000 a year salary. That is not peanuts, plus you're adding on benefits. Um, and we have to keep in mind that our taxpayers are paying these salaries. So I, you know, I would not like to see us take the residency out of the realm from the standpoint of I, would want, I wouldn't want anybody to take advantage of the fact that uh, a, a Williamsport citizen is not taken into consideration first. Even though we were guaranteed that by the mayor that, you know, he would look at he had two qualified people that the citizen, you know, in Williamsport would get the, the better, you know, offer. Um, but I just, I, you know, I, I just feel that we have to take into consideration that we don't know how this is going to go down the line. Um, with other people, with how other people will hire, hire citizens. Um, I would rather go the, the waiver route and leave our, our residency intact at this point of what we have right now and, uh, and keep it at that because of where this all stands. You know, it's once you open that door, yes, I, I can understand what you're all doing. And Joel, you did a wonderful job in all your research. Um, Ms. Mealy, you did too. And, and I understand where we're looking for qualified people. But what you're also saying is we don't have any qualified people in Williamsport. And at times I find that kind of disturbing, that, you know, let's, let's give the citizens a shot first, and then we can uh, go on the outside. And that's how I would like to see it. Uh, Mr. Allison. Um, we, uh, and, and we just, well, I, I think it's important to note um, Part of the ordinance does not say live in Williamsport. It, it's a five-mile radius, so there's already some wiggle room there. Um, so, uh, and obviously there's still some uh, undercurrent here of from different uh, council people. Um, as to, to how to approach this. I, I think, as you said, everybody agrees, we'd prefer to have people that, that do live right in the city, but we've already changed that somewhat. And, and I think I said this last time, um, the ability to identify qualified candidates in each particular search is, is only gonna be as good as that search is. So those things, are variable as well. If it's not a, a constant, um, um, held to a constant level of uh, quali a quality search, or if there's no way to guarantee that, um, we're not always comparing apples to apples. But, um, but hearing these things, um, perhaps it might be wise just for the, the time being, and, and we, we'll, we could talk about this forever, True. but um, uh, the one thing we need to assure, first of all, is, is that we take care of the current position, the HR position, and make sure that we get that person in. Um, we could have 
an ad hoc committee consider these things a little more in depth, um, maybe they're, just to assure ourselves that there's nothing we're missing about this issue um, that would be workable to, to have people um, at, uh, that qualify and, and could still come from that pool that would be willing to relocate because um, I, I think it's, th there are reasons for, to have residency requirements, but on the other hand, um, not as many as there were in the past because of technology now. There are jobs that aren't as essential for the person to live in the city because they can communicate that way. Uh, as Councilman Noviello said, some of the public safety or um, you know, the public works, there's benefit in that. Um, so, you know, we could take some, a little bit of time, we can't take forever, but to weigh those out because we have other positions we're going to need to fill soon. So um, I would be in favor of doing that, uh, taking care of this issue tonight, having an ad hoc committee look at it a little closer um, to assure that we've turned every stone over and then come back with a recommendation that we could vote on. Um, and, and just to clarify that for a second before uh, I turn over to Ms. Noviello, um, we need to change the ordinance tonight because of, mm -hmm. of the one position we, we've talked about. Um, the question is, what is the waypoint? Is it what we passed last week? It is one of the options that uh, uh, Ms. Mealy uh, presented tonight, and then we can then come back to it again through an ad hoc committee would, would be a, an option how to do it. Mr. Noviello, you had raised your uh, hand. Just a couple of points and then a question for Mr. Smith, if I might. Uh, I understand Mrs. Katz's point of view, and I agree. But I don't necessarily think that if we were to dismiss the residency law that that would, by necessity, preclude anybody from the city from submitting an application for any position that might be open at the right. same time. Um, uh, the ad hoc committee, I think, would be, you know, seems to be the best way to proceed at this point, at least anyhow. Uh, with respect to a waiver, Mr. Smith, would that open us up to any kind of discrimination suit? No. Okay. Not, not, I mean, it would be a case-by-case -case analysis, but under these circumstances, no. So it would be related to language that we use? Uh, it, it's, it's related, I, I mean, if, there, if this were waived on a basis that it reflected a pattern where you were impacting adversely protected classes, then you might have an issue, but under these circumstances, I would suggest no. Thank you. Um, uh, w another thought that I shared, uh, I think uh, maybe just with Ms. Mealy uh, via email this week, um, uh, in terms of the desirability for, or, or, it, I agree with, um, Ms. Katz started the idea and it was built upon um, that we have qualified people for many positions in the city. Um, and, and my, my thought that we want to make sure that we have the most qualified pools, and we don't know that until people apply, um, how qualified the whole pool will be or how large the pool will be, and therefore whether or not someone from within the city is the most qualified interested party, um, I think is part of it. Um, but in terms of we want people to live in the city and making the city a desirable place for the city's employees to live, one thought that I shared with Ms. Mealy that could be entered into this and could in my mind, um, if we have an ad hoc committee, we could flesh this idea out, but marry together the idea of not having a residency requirement, but balancing that out with uh, making moving into the city a desirable thing. We could make it a policy. Um, it would might cost a little bit of money each time a hire was made, but make it a policy of the city that we have a relocation cost. Many employers have relocation cost. But you only receive the relocation cost if you're from outside the area, and when you move to the area, um, you move to within the city. I mean, uh, that it, something along those lines could be an added carrot uh, for choosing the city if, if it happens to be somebody that we're hiring from outside the area, which is more true in some positions than others. Um, I, we need to make some kind of decision, um, and of course we can discuss this. Um, I'm going to make a 
procedural uh, motion um, to help us to decide what our stopping point is. I think we'll end up with uh, an ad hoc committee. I think that's a good idea. But we need a stopping point tonight um, on final reading. And so one uh, way to decide which stopping point we have is to decide between um, what we passed on first reading and one of the proposals here. And so um, if I make the motion uh, of the proposal to, the amendment would be amendment in the form of a substitution, I believe, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, uh, to, uh, and the new uh, ordinance would read, according to this uh, option put together uh, by Mr. Lubin and, and Ms. Mealy, um, Section 1, the existing Article 149.09 residency requirements is hereby repealed in its entirety. Section 2, effective date, this ordinance shall become effective 20 days after final enactment. If I were to make that motion, um, then ultimately, I mean, we can talk about it more, of course, mm -hmm. but the decision would be, are we going to go forward with one option, the one that uh, passed on first reading, or a different option, that motion, um, and then, of course, we'd have one more procedural vote uh, to decide that, that would approve of the, one, of the choice of those two things that we just made. So from a procedural standpoint, it gets us to the point of making a decision on where we stop tonight. Um, uh, any thoughts on if you're okay with me making that motion? I, I just want to get a sense of, of, of my colleagues before I actually get to the point of the formal motion making. Mr. Novio. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Mealy. Never been mistaken for Dom before. No, no, no. He was <laughs> waving a pen down there or something. Yeah, he was. <laughs> um, I, I would be perfectly comfortable with that motion, and I would point out that I, I don't believe that even if we were to um, repeal the existing ordinance tonight, it does not preclude us examining it and passing it in some mm -hmm. similar form. Mm -hmm. If you know, if it doesn't, it does not. It wouldn't preclude us creating an ad hoc committee, giving them mm -hmm. a two-month time span to examine the issue, and then instituting a similar ordinance, perhaps to what we have before, or perhaps slightly different um, at some point in the next few months. Yeah. So we pass the amendment tonight with a contingent of that? No, the, the no. ad hoc committee would be created at the discretion of the chair, and, I, and I'm telling you I would do that okay. um, uh, with the charge of, say, two months uh, to come up with a, a new recommendation. But in the meantime, we would not have a residency ordinance until that, just, just mm -hmm. to clarify, that would be the impact. That would be the impact and my intention, yes. Right. Uh, comments or questions before I make that motion? If we do, if we're going to vote on the repeal. Yeah, the, so procedurally, um, I make the motion to sub, uh, in the form of a sub, amendment in the form of a substitution. Mm -hmm. The substitution is repeal in its entirety, essentially. Um, then we would vote for that. If my amendment passes, then the motion on the floor would be repeal. Then we would vote to repeal or not repeal. And then, of course, that would allow the mayor to um, complete the process he initiated in terms of hiring, but then would allow us to come back and uh, recreate the motion um, or re recreate an ordinance once we've had more time for discussion. If there's no objections to that, then um, let me make the motion. Do you need me to repeat the full text? Okay. I make a motion to amend in the form of substitution. Mr. Smith, that is the right structure, correct? Okay. Um, uh, and the, my uh, amendment uh, would read Section 1, the, and I can give you this in text, Mrs. Frank. Um, uh, Section 1, the existing Article 149.09 residency requirements is hereby repealed in its entirety. Section 2, effective date, this ordinance shall become effective 20 days after final enactment. Um, uh, that's my motion. Can I have a second? Second. Hearing a motion and a second. Um, and just one more comment before I, I bring up opinions. Um, clearly, uh, uh, when we vote on this, you can vote. I, I think the effect ultimately of, of this is if you were to vote yes, you'd be voting to temporarily repeal. If you'd be voting no, um, then we would stick to the ordinance as it passed on first reading. If that passes, then it's the effect of, of reducing, removing the residency requirements, except for, and I didn't, public safety except positions. for public safety positions. Um, and if that 
failed for some reason, then we would retain residency requirements for all positions. So comments or questions on the motion to amend to the version that repeals all residency requirements? Like a family tree. Yeah. I, and I don't want to confuse anybody, so uh, if, if you're unclear, please ask. Mr. Henderson. Thank you. Uh, what this does is it gives us a, a blank slate mm -hmm. to work with. That's what, if we pass this uh, motion to amend, uh, then we'll vote on that. Uh, so I think that's good. I think that's important because what we have now is a mess. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it that way, it is a mess. Uh, and I've done some uh, research in, in, uh, to what other cities have done even around the nation. Uh, this is a common issue. This is common. And a lot of cities are tackling this issue or trying to. And uh, some, some cities uh, have ended up amending their residency ordinance so often for specific individuals, which we have started to do, mm -hmm. uh, that their residency ordinances are very confusing, uh, and, and it just, it's a tangled mess. Uh, other cities have gone with the waiver, uh, and consequently, I was reading of one city where almost 50% of their employees have gotten that waiver. So in essence, they've just done away with the residency ordinance, uh, and, and it just doesn't seem very effective at all. I, I think this is it's good for us to kind of just give ourselves a clean slate. I like the idea of the committee, the ad hoc, uh, and we can really examine this better because we really do need more time mm -hmm. to look at this. Uh, so I, I, I do agree with this. I think it's a good uh, first step. This gets us past our first ordinance. It really cleans things up for us for a fresh start. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman. I'm sorry, Mr. Nichols. Uh, just a point of clarification. Um, the candidate in question for the HR position, um, if you have a clean slate, so to speak, what assurance would this person have that in bringing something back that all of a sudden she would be subject to that ordinance? Does there be anything legislative intent in the minutes that could provide some assurance that this? I don't think you can make that retroactive. You would only, if the ordinance okay. comes back and the position is defined to include a residency requirement, as long as this individual. They would be grandfathered. Would be grandfathered. Now, let me but ask there a further a clarification. <laughs> the new ordinance eliminating residency wouldn't kick in for 20 days. So if we then reinstated a residency requirement, not that we, that would be our intention, that would apply to a person in that position, would the residency requirement? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but there was language in, in the current ordinance that stated that if a said person are in a position covered by the residency or moved during her employment that then they would have to move into the city if mm -hmm. they I but just for example if we were to pass an ordinance that said no employee of the city could live within 500 yards of Brandon Park would people I'd have to move <laughs> but what Mr. Smith said is you wouldn't have to move since he's since you cannot make that kind of requirement which sort of makes you a grandfather. <laughs> uh, okay, well, so that. So I, I'm not sure that we could provide any better assurances. Well, if this is opinion, it could be memorialized in the minutes that be the, same the current applicant of the HR position would not be required to move into the city, I think that that would satisfy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that would at all be the intention, but I, based on what he said further, if that individual started within the next 20 days, assuming this passed the tonight, and I want to make sure I, ha I understood him correctly, so I'll, I'll just wait a second. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Sorry. That's okay. I was, I was addressing. No, 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 it's okay. It's, this is a, a complex one. So if the individual were to start within the next 20 days, that individual would not have assurances, assuming this amendment passes on. Uh, uh, un, unless council were to represent as not necessarily as part of this ordinance, but as a statement of good faith that it will not apply to that person. I think that that's. But there's no legal assurances that we can provide, but we can state yes. our intention would not to be apply anything to anyone who uh, might take a position given that there's no residency requirements. That's correct. And I, I think that is my intention, and, and I'll let others speak. Mr. Mayor. very complex issue and HR has changed over the years <clears throat> and I would appreciate council to make this change tonight so the HR director can start on the 13th and then all of us sit back take a little bit of a breather have the ad hoc committee council and the administration to work together in regards to come up with a why don't we say a more definitive definition I think that would be very very helpful uh, also, in regards to the applicant, if we could have uh, not only the minutes, but we could have some type of documentation from council, that would be very, very helpful. And also, uh, what Mr. Smith said in regards to a retroactive uh, position, I think that would solidify everything, and then we can move on. Thank I'm you. not sure that we can accomplish all of those things, but at least in terms of expressing our intention, of course, that doesn't hold us from changing our mind or future councils uh, from changing something. But I think it, 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 my intention would be to not deceive through this action. Uh, other comments or questions on the amendment to the ordinance? Uh, the amendment to the ordinance that passed in first reading. Right. Hearing none, Mrs. Frank. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Novello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes. Uh, and so now we are back on uh, the ordinance and final reading as amended, uh, I believe, uh, which is to say now the version would repeal uh, residency requirement. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? Do we, Mr. Allison. Do we need to go on record as? As you did? Um, if you choose, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, I would go on record as agreeing this is not meant to uh, deceive the current applicant for HR. Um, and there would be no um, uh, subsequent uh, action to try to change that. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Mr. Anderson. Um, I would uh, concur, and I, and I would just say the very reason that we're taking action right now <laughs> is, is for that applicant. It's the very reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that, I think, in some ways, that speaks for itself. Uh, but just point that out again. Uh, other comments or questions? Mrs. Katz. This, this one now. We're going to vote on this one. And if we give us the yes and no. Yeah, the, a vote yes here uh, re eliminates the residency requirement. A vote no uh, retains the residency requirement as uh, codified in our ordinances. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Mrs. Frank, uh, on the ordinance in final reading as amended. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. No. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and the ordinance uh, as amended uh, uh, passes in final reading um, six to one. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Nichols. Uh, next item on the agenda uh, then. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, before uh, we leave that, um, I'd like to make a couple statements concerning this residency issue. Absolutely, Mr. Smith. Uh, I think it is significant in what we're doing. Where I have a concern 
which we at this point can't change, is with public safety. And I guess I want to ask a question of the other members of council. Perhaps I was sleeping, but when we went over the police contract, were we all aware that what we approved eliminated all the residency requirements for the policemen? There are no residency requirements as I understand it in reading the police contract. That's why I brought out, I think two weeks ago, that technically we can have a police officer living in Omaha, Nebraska and fly in every day to come to work. I was not aware of that, that it was in the contract until we passed it. And that somewhat bothers me. Uh, I have been told, I, I can't vouch for the accuracy of it, and perhaps Chief Young can, that as of January 1st, we had one of our officers that now lives in Blossburg. Is that correct? I'm not familiar with that specifically. I don't know. I can't answer that because I don't know. Okay. I, I guess what bothers me is we currently, for the fire department, under that contract, we have an area where they must reside. And certainly when the fire contract comes up again, that's going to be a real issue we're going to have to deal with. Now I'm concerned about the fact that we have a major incident and all of our policemen and firemen live outside the city and some of them were, could take an hour to get into the city and we have a major safety event. Wow, we're going to be sure calling a lot of mutual aid from Montoursville and South Williamsport, Du Bois Town, Ole Cumming. I'm really concerned about the safety issues of having no residency requirement whatsoever, even if it is within X number of miles, which is the way I understand our fire contract is. Um, it's a concern I have. And when I went over the police contract, I didn't see it in there where there was any residency requirement, whatever. And when I did make some inquiries, they said, no, that's not part of the contract. Can I ask a quick question in the middle of your comments? Was that a change in this particular contract? Yes, this contract. As I understand it, and I, I didn't have time to pull out the previous contract, but I was told that the previous contract did have a residency requirement. And this one doesn't. The previous contract, I believe, was uh, 20, uh, 20 miles, I believe. Um, one, and if I could speak on the current contract and the neg neg negotiation aspect of it, is that if the age of cell phones and the road systems that we have, the number of officers that we have, and the applicant pool that we're trying to draw from has dwindled in such a manner that if we close down our borders on where someone can reside, our applicant pool is even going to be smaller. But the problem with that, that I see it, is that's traveling distance. Yeah, we have a cell phone that we can call them, but if they live an hour and a half away, it's going to take them an hour and a half to get here. Whether you have a cell phone or whatever kind of a phone, there's a travel time involved. And should we have major incidents like uh, a tornado or trees down in a wide area, those roads could be blocked. I mean, I, I'm very concerned about our public safety people that can actually live any place. Technically, they could live on the New York border and come to work each day. I mean, there are people that do, in, in the business world, travel an hour, an hour and a half to go to work. That's not uncommon. But boy, I, I'm fearful we ever have a major incident and we have police and fire that live this far away. I don't know, we could, I just hope we got a good mutual aid contract with, with our neighbors because it could open us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Novio. Just a, that's just a quick reflection on what I mentioned a moment ago about the idea of having emergency people available mm -hmm. to us, uh, situations that Mr. Smith mentioned. Uh, I would assume, at least at this early stage of these events, 
that would be one of the things at the top of the list for the ad hoc committee uh, to begin to address mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. Because it does put us in a untenable situation, I think, given certain circumstances. So just some food for thought, if nothing else there. Right. Um, and, and I think uh, after the meeting, I'll uh, talk to each of you about, uh, you know, who's interested on the ad hoc committee, and, and we'll go ahead and, and set that up, which doesn't really require any formal action. I'll just uh, let Mrs. Frank know um, that it exists. I believe that's correct for ad hoc meetings. There are no formal actions needed. Mr. Mayor. Yes, just one last point I'd like to make is, yes, we do live in a different world. And in some of these occupations, it's very difficult to even get applicants. In the last round for the police department, it was seven, correct, Chief? Only seven applicants to become a Williamsport police person. Very, very sad. And if you close that, you may not get any. That's a reality. It's not positive, but it's a reality right now. But what was the recruitment effort? We don't know as council what that recruitment effort has been. I understand that King's College and some of these other folks have many, many people graduating. Have we gone over there and visited those colleges and, and tried to recruit? I mean, colleges to recruit students have a recruiting division that goes out all over and uh, sets up uh, conferences and so forth for uh, possible students and companies do this they go out and recruit you know if we just try to recruit putting something in a newspaper here you know th that may not do it and, and, and I'm concerned about I keep hearing this and in, in our police department we can never achieve the numbers we haven't been at our budgeted number in how many years you know we hire three two leave we hire four three leave uh, I guess we need to find out why these folks are leaving, why they're not staying with us with longevity like the older officers did. But, you know, I've been told by people in Wilkes-Barre and Scranton, if you can't find police people, you've got a problem. And these are law enforcement people telling me that in Wilkes-Barre. They say your recruitment efforts apparently aren't to where they should be. Now, that's what I'm hearing. So I don't know. I'm not involved in the recruitment process. Uh, maybe that needs to be looked at. As Mayor, you say, we're not going to get any. Well, then maybe we need to widen our area. And I think Mr. Noviello brought out a point when we're talking about uh, the city engineer. We're just not going to look here. We may have to go statewide or nationwide to try to find somebody to bring in. for our testing procedures. They were contacted, sent a packet, the packet was addressed with the students that were currently in the Act 120 class. So we touched every base we could in Pennsylvania for the Act 120 certification for, for applicants for this test, current testing procedure that we're, that we're in. Um, I don't want to let this conversation go on too long. We need to get back to the agenda, but a couple more comments. Uh, Mr. Miller. I just would ask the Chief, would you be in favor of uh, trying to find an individual within the ranks who might attend the various job fairs that almost all the colleges and universities put on near the end of most of their semesters? Yeah. Um, that would be a, that's something along the lines of that outreach mm -hmm. that goes beyond the mailing sort of aspect. Sometimes mailers just get kind of set aside because they get great numbers of them, believe me. But going to a job fair and setting up a, a booth or a table or something to that effect might have a little bit better chance of finding some success. The state success police through that. Yeah, the state police I, 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 I happened to see one in Hershey that was going on at a conference center. I was at a conference center for a conference, and the state police were there doing yeah. recruiting. We've had them at the college. We've also started preliminary process and discussions with the upcoming uh, testing cycle that we hope to give this summer as to whether they get Act 120 certification required or not. And that's... That, without the Act 120 certification, I, I believe will expand our applicant pool, but it also delays the hiring process. So it goes, it goes back and forth as to being able to put someone on the street when you hire them versus sending them away to school for six months and then they come back. Then you have to train them, and then they're actually not put on the street until the nine-month period. So it's, it's a give and take, depending on our numbers, where we're at, and how we can turn that over. 
Uh, I just wanted to point out quickly that we have had some uh, changes in leadership in the police department within the last uh, nine months. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that, that, that consequently you have two things. I think that the long-term impact of, of excellent leadership, um, which is what we, we seem to have right now in the police department, um, is that staffing becomes um, easier as, as, that, as that leadership is known. Um, however, the short-term impact of a change in leadership is often dissatisfaction with people who see things changing. And, you know, I, I think there's an increase in turnover when you change hands, when you change courses, even if the new course is indeed a beneficial one. Um, consequently, I would like to think that um, while I, I do believe that we should make every effort to reach out and find all available candidates, um, this may be a, a temporary situation that we find ourselves in that, that may, um, to a certain extent, improve of its own accord. Um, the other thing I would say, um, from my own perspective, is that uh, it, it seems to me that it would be beneficial um, both to officers and to the population in Williamsport if our police force um, more accurately mirrored the, the makeup of, of Williamsport's population, that is to say more women um, and more minorities. Um, and I, I think that that will be very difficult for us to accomplish unless we are willing to take people who are not Act 120 certified and train them. Um, so moving forward, I think it would be wise for us to consider that as an option, especially if we can get ourselves to a full complement and then, or, or close to a full complement, and then just have a few positions out there that, that we have to have in training. But that said. All right, um, I'm going to take that opportunity then to get back to the agenda. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is authorizing a resolution authorizing the City of Williamsport uh, uh, Bureau of Transportation for a grant application. Uh, Ms. Frank. Authorizing resolution. Resolution authorizing the filing of applications with the Federal Transit Administration and Operating Administration of the United States Department of Transportation for federal transportation assistance offered, authorized by 49 U.S.C. Chapter 53 and or authorized by any other federal statutes administered by the Federal Trans Transit Administration, including but not limited to applicable sections of 23 U.S.C. Chapter 23. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution? So moved. Second. Hear a motion and a second. Mr. Nichols. Good evening again. Uh, this is a standard resolution, <laughs> as I like to say every now and then. <laughs> I was waiting uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's required by the Federal Transit Administration as part of our annual operating capital and planning grant application process under the current federal uh, pu public transportation legislation. This, this resolution is required to be updated every seven years uh, or earlier if there are changes related to the city officials that are designated in the resolution. The only change from the previously approved resolution is the addition of the fourth whereas clause which affirms that the City of Williamsport on behalf of River Valley Transit is the designated recipient of Federal <coughs> Transit Administration funding assistance. Uh, this was reviewed by the Finance Committee and I defer back to the Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mealy. Finance did review this standard resolution um, <laughs> per Mr. Nichols um, and forwarded to the full body of counsel with a positive recommendation. Um, as Mr. Nichols did inform us, there's nothing to see here. <laughs> That's when you really worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, everything, everything seemed to be uh, in place and, and above board, and we forwarded it to the full body of council. All, all three fathers speak like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from members of council? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank, please. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and uh, the resolution is approved. Next item on the agenda is resolution to accept uh, RVT's performance report. Ms. Frank. Resolution to accept River Valley Transit's 2015 performance report and plan update, including an action plan. Uh, thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, resolution? So moved. Hearing motion and a second. Mr. Nichols. Uh, this is not a standard resolution because it only comes up every few years, but it's part of our uh, 2015 performance report and plan update. Uh, typically, this annual report is reviewed by, as, uh, reviewed by and approved as part of the Unified Planning Work Program, which is under the auspices of the uh, Watts MPO process uh, that Council has representation on. But, but every five years, PENDA collaborates with each transit system in the state to review system performance as mandated by Act 44 and makes recommendations to be included in our annual performance report in the form of an action plan. 
So as indicated in the performance report that you have in front of you, uh, any internal or external recommendations for system improvements are included in this report um, in the form of an action plan. And uh, in this case, the action plan is incorporated into our strategic update uh, plan, which will be completed sometime this year. Uh, the report in front of you includes sections on uh, service delivery highlights, uh, our management uh, of the best trans transit system up north in Tioga, Bradford, and Sullivan counties, um, a report or update on transit uh, development projects, administrative accomplishments, our system performance, and then again the action plan, which is the last part of the report. Um, highlights of this action plan, again, this in collaboration with PennDOT, uh, features a recently completed rider survey, which is really interesting, where on a given day, one day, we had, we surveyed 500 people out of the 4,000 people that rode. Um, the survey is in the report and, as, and also the results of that survey, which you might find interesting. Um, we also plan to conduct a non-rider survey. Uh, the last one we did was a few years ago with Cedar Cog, and uh, that'll be done sometime this year. And also, they recommend that we do an on-time survey using our new AVL technology. Um, we also have marketing recommendations in the report. Um, they encourage us to do a, a system map, which we'll be undertaking, um, adding customer service metrics, and also they would like to see our annual marketing plan included in the performance report that you have in front of you. And last, we're recommending that we annually report on our 29 performance standards. You may recall that every year we came in front of you and went over 29 performance standards, which was always a highlight of any given council year. Um, but that was part of Act 26, which was discontinued, but they'd like to see us uh, uh, provide those 29 performance standards in the report annual basis because they are um, good indicators of just how we're doing. And also something with road calls in the report and continue our plan for off-site data backup. So with that, we're asking in this case, um, this report also went to the WATCH Transportation Committees, but in this case, and I was asking you also to formally indicate that uh, you, you have the report and have you accepted it, including the recommendations that we came up with. Thank you, and reviewed by? Finance Committee. Finance. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mealy. Um, finance did uh, did review this report and um, and forwarded to the full body of council with a positive recommendation. Um, there's actually nothing particularly financial in it, aside from <laughs> right. You were getting um, those other ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but we uh, we did appreciate the uh, the thorough over overview of it, actually, that, um, that Mr. Nichols gave us. Um, it's a, a pretty comprehensive evaluation of RVT's performance and. Uh, uh, particularly interesting, I guess, to see um, the points that the, the issues that PennDOT raises, and, um, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a nice counterpoint, uh, especially for those of us for whom uh, transit can be a little bit of a, a, a different language. <laughs> some of the um, some of the concepts there. Um, anyway, we uh, we reviewed it and forwarded it to the full body of council with positive recommendation. Thank you. Comments or questions, Mrs. Katz. We just appreciate everything you do with River Valley. And to see this report, I mean, the performance report is absolutely incredible. It really is. Um, when you start looking at this, and as you said, the, the only area that really is not up to par for some of the customers is uh, bus, what do you call it? Yeah, the, that, that uh, survey, um, you know, which they require when they do this review, well, I think there was 20 some questions and, and, and results and, and this is very con this is very similar uh, to the last one we did, and that is uh, comfort at bus stops, meaning they want more bus shelters. And uh, that's um, we try to add at least three bus shelters a year, but you know it's a costly thing, but I think it's obviously indication that it's important. The other thing that is the other thing that they ask for continually is more weekend service, meaning they would like to see service on Sundays, and that's something that, uh, again, um, we don't know where the federal transit legislation is going on the new administration, but if there is more funding, um, it seems to be a, an emphasis on infrastructure, but I'm hoping there's also, um, you know, some more funding for transit because that would be the first thing that we would do is add Sunday service. We've not received any, we've not really uh, had any increases in federal transit funding for years, so it's pretty hard to 
to expand your services when, when there's absolutely no additional revenue sources available. And that would be the best thing that could happen for us because there are, there are a lot of people who don't have cars mm -hmm. and they do depend mm -hmm. on the bus to get to their jobs. And a lot of people are working on Sundays. They are. So it would be nice if that would happen. And we also understand that the, the comfort stops. What's going on in society is people ruin these, these places. And yeah, it costs it's a, a struggle. ton of money. Right, it costs it's a, a ton of money to replace, which is sad. It really is yeah, sad. It's, it's an ongoing, it really is an issue, and but I'm not sure what you do about it. But thank you very much for, yeah, for thank the report. You. It was very interesting all the way around. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Um, we discussed a lot of things, um, and there's a lot of good information in here. And, and there's the financial information as well. On uh, page 24, there's a, a, a total breakdown for and everything in here references 2015. But um, the message from the general manager who happens to be up at the podium. Uh, there's just a couple highlights that we, we talked about uh, that uh, Mr. Nichols pointed out in the second paragraph down um, that uh, he reported that RVT met all six targets of the uh, FTA small transit intensive cities program. We were one of only two transit systems in Pennsylvania and only 11 small systems nationally to achieve this distinction. So we're, uh, uh, the reputation of our VT is well earned. And, um, and then the, the next one down uh, references the, um, the, uh, the passengers uh, onboard survey. And um, of the 502 passengers that completed the uh, onboard survey, 95% responded they were satisfied or very satisfied with RVT's overall service. So um, I think we're doing everything we can, and RVT is, and we benefit from that as a, as a municipality to, uh, to hit all the, the right notes and provide uh, as comprehensive a service as possible. Um, unfortunately, we, we do rely on federal transportation money and state transportation money because um, the rides are subsidized. I think uh, to, uh, is it two thirds of the cost? It's about uh, two thirds, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, they, they, it's always argued, well, you know, it's subsidized, but so are airports, so are highways, so right, every yeah. form of transportation is subsidized. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, yeah, it's part of uh, what, we, uh, what we do as uh, a country and a community and a state and a city. So it um, provides a, an important service for people. And uh, we talked a little bit about, I, I remember when I was, a child, which it was, I was born a after the Civil War, but there, there were automobiles. But uh, uh, th that was in the day when there weren't. Uh, every family did not have two vehicles. You know, it wasn't that common for for everyone to have two vehicles. So um, uh, we rode the bus uh, locally to to get to places and. Uh, you know, took full advantage of it, so there, there is a lot of benefit to it. Thank if you want to see the difference, uh, we have a restored 1962 bus in the museum, and if you look at what buses are today, mm -hmm. it's, it's remarkable. And so, I mean, the air conditioned and all the conveniences, so to speak. And uh, this is not fake news, but I do appreciate all my relatives filling out the surveys. <laughs> 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 One of the things that we did discuss at finance is that we feel that we all should take a bus trip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That we all should get on and go on a bus. I think I said we should all spend a week riding the bus. Oh. <laughs> but of oh, course, I, I have a unique position because like I can walk just about spot. <laughs> 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 It's sunny Florida. Mm -hmm. Mr. Smith. I can remember when I was a child going to uh, in Toursville, we picked up the stagecoach downtown the <laughs> and would go back and forth. So we'd come a long ways from the stagecoach. Mr. Nichols still provides that service, but only on yeah, Sundays. Only on Sundays. <laughs> uh, I just want to comment that I read uh, probably about 90% of this report. Some of the involved charts I, I really didn't 
spend a lot of time on, but I did the narrative. Uh, and I think, Bill, that uh, it was very thorough, the information that was put in here. Uh, you also, I want to note, looked at and discussed the financial part of it, of expenses and future income. And, and I think there's an important part here that really was on page 28 that I had read. Uh, and it says, finally, regarding the last line of defense, it is clear from the analysis presented above that financial support on the part of the local governments and other private sector partners will have to increase over time. Contributions from the municipalities participating in the system were last increased in fiscal 2004, but it will be necessary to raise the local share again in the near and midterm future. In addition, it will be imperative for RVT to restore its commitment of funds to support RVT's transit operations on an ongoing basis. And I think from 2004 to 2017 is quite an area without having to raise those funds to be able to uh, consistently provide the services that we do to these communities. And I think, Bill, you're right. At some point, it's going to have to increase other folks' share to be able to continue to uh, provide the operation. Uh, the other thing that was interesting is in the map in here of the areas of the possibility of covering in the future. I think that's very interesting, and we had discussed that uh, previously on Council, uh, whereby the management capability uh, being shown uh, in EMTA, which is now the best transportation system, uh, has worked out very well. Wouldn't you say, Bill, that uh, it has worked out well for the city and worked out well for those folks? Well, it's worked out in terms of, when we say 2004, as I've mentioned before, we actually haven't raised a local share to the original partners of the system even longer than that because we add new partners, which gives us that local share. Best Trance has worked out because, we, you know, they pay us a management fee, which, again, you know, keeps the, the, the local share to the original partners the same. But if you run out of new partners, then the inevitable would be there might be a slight increase in the local share. But as long as we can find new partners to keep up the pace, mm -hmm. then we should be in pretty good. Well, and, and I think that the much. management of that best transportation system is showing uh, that RVT has the capability to manage other systems besides mm -hmm. our own which can only bode well for us in the future as costs go up and we look at other areas of possible management of bringing additional funds into our system. Uh, I think we have to applaud the efforts of RVT in, in looking toward that goal of bringing in more dollars. So, you know, this was, a, a I thought, a very well put together narrative. Uh, on the operation of, uh, of the system. And uh, I just want to thank you, Bill, you and your staff for the time involved in putting this together. And I, also what was extremely interesting was how you acquired all that data. Uh, I like data. I like reading statistics because it, you can certainly get an idea of where you've been and where you are and then where you're going to go. And I think that the methods that you used, other than using your friends uh, to, to uh, <laughs> do the surveys, I, I think that there's a, a lot of very important data in here, and it shows where the future lies with, with RVT and uh, other management possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Other yeah, comments? Thank you. And I just uh, mentioned that the state has been pushing regionalization. As, and that's what's mm -hmm. happening all over the state. Um, uh, most recently, Lancaster and Reading uh, joined together, and it's happening. And, and if, if we don't stay on top of it and be a leader, then we're going to be on the end of the, you know, totem pole. So, you know, I see over the years, you know, a uh, much larger area with RVT right in the center of it. So that's pretty exciting to see. Just uh, and they and PennDOT does provide extra funds if you take if you do regionaliz regionalization efforts. So mm -hmm. it's uh, something to you know, stay on top of as much as we can. 
Thank you. Other comments or questions? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank on the resolution, please. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Ms. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and that resolution passes. Uh, thank next, you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Uh, next item on the agenda is a resolution designating an agent from the city to execute FEMA documents. Mrs. Frank. A resolution designating an agent from the City of Williamsport to execute FEMA documents number 4292-DR-PA. Uh, thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to approve uh, this resolution? So moved. Second. Very much and a second. Mr. Grader, how are you this evening? Uh, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, President Williamson, members of council. Uh, this uh, resolution authorizes Tom Sillo, our, the general manager of the city's Department of Streets and Parks, to be the agent uh, to uh, fill out all the required forms and documents uh, for the uh, disaster relief assistance uh, that's available to the city as a result of the event of October 20, 20th and 21st of last year, uh, the flood event. Um, it was declared uh, as a uh, federal disaster and public assistance for public uh, use was uh, determined to be eligible. Uh, the, the last time we uh, were able to apply for these funds, it was in 2011. Uh, a similar agreement was uh, required. Um, what we, we did not sustain uh, physical damage in the city as they did up north. Uh, in the northern counties, uh, but we are able to uh, uh, recuperate the overtime uh, that was uh, used during that flood event uh, and also the operation of the pump stations as it relates to the streets department. Uh, the other department that did uh, was able to uh, recuperate funds is the uh, fire department because they responded uh, actually not just within the city, but outside the city limits. Uh, so um, this is just a standard uh, public disaster assistance application uh, that's necessary in order to recuperate those funds. Uh, this was reviewed by the Finance Committee. Thank you. Ms. Mealy? Uh, yes, this uh, was reviewed by Finance, and um, we ascertained that Mr. Silo is indeed uh, not that it's an incredible responsibility to act as the um, uh, as, to act as the executor for these funds, but um, but that he he um, the fear, of course, right, is that we would not receive the fundings after Mr. Grader retires. So we need a designated agent um, who will be working for the city at the time that the funding arrives. Um, consequently, Mr. Silo is is sort of next in line, I suppose, um, especially since his department incurred most of the claims. Um, but uh, uh, John said that Tom is um, sort of aware of the responsibilities involved in this and, and perfectly equipped to take it on. And um, with that, finance forwarded it to the full body of council with positive recommendation. Thank you. Comments or questions? Do we have any estimate of what the reimbursement amount will be? Well, uh, I know th Tom has met with the Pima representatives and then they work uh, the worksheets. Uh, there's about $24,000 in the streets department. Uh, Dave Dimmick is, or Chief Dimmick has been working with them. This is probably going to be less as far as the cost of the personnel, but there is a, the boat, their rescue boat was irreparably damaged. Uh, that's being, uh, was submitted to the insurance company. So we're waiting to see what the insurance company uh, is covering and what isn't covered by the insurance would be covered uh, or may be covered under this uh, disaster, such as the deductible, for example. Um, so, um, but and so I would say we're looking at least over thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars. Wow. Thank you, uh, Mr. Henderson. Yeah, just wanted to just note that uh, in pursuing these funds. Uh, we have to agree to how many? One, two, three. I mean, you count them all down here. There are 42 yeah, like 40. uh, in the list here that I see requirements. And uh, that is, talk about overburdening regulations. 
uh, you know, hey, it's their money, they're going to tell us what we can and can't do with it. And it's just interesting to note that that's a lot. That's, uh, that was just overwhelming when I was reading through that, thinking we've got to do that. We've got to make sure we do this, and we've got to do that. We've got to, you know, all of these things. 42. 42 uh, requirements that we need to meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th those are always buried in all the federal grants that we get. Yeah. Those are typical Incredible. Uh, requirements. Incredible. So I just wanted to note that. Thank you. Uh, other comments or questions? Hearing none, Mrs. Frank, on the resolution, please. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, and uh, the resolution carries. Um, I believe, uh, if I've jumped around correctly, that that brings us to item number 15, except for filing. Um, and so we have uh, the codes report for April, May, and June 2016, public works uh, committee meeting minutes of uh, October 11th, 2016, and the controller's report for December 16th, 2016. I have a motion and a second to accept those for filing. Second. Hear your motion and second. Comments or questions? Hearing none, Ms. Frank. Ms. Mealy. Yes. Mr. Noviello. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mrs. Katz. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Allison. Yes. Dr. Williamson. Yes, uh, and those are accepted for filing. Next item on the agenda is announcements. Um, we will be held, holding uh, an executive session this evening following the regularly scheduled meeting uh, for the purpose of negotiation. The next regularly scheduled City Council meeting will be held on Thursday, February 16th. Uh, at 7.30 p.m. Uh, right here in uh, Council Chambers. Other upcoming meetings include Monday, February 6th at noon is the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, Tuesday, February 7th at noon is Public Safety meeting. Uh, and at 11.30 uh, will be a, a Heart of Williamsport work session uh, being held uh, for the benefit of City Council and, and the Planning Commission. Um, uh, on Wednesday, February 8th at 11 a.m. is the Bowman Field Commission and at 3.30 is O&E Pension Board. On Monday, February 13th at 11 is the Training for Downtown Businesses. At 3.30 uh, p.m. is Board of uh, Tax Appeals, which we now have. Um, and at 4 p.m. is the Recreation Commission. Tuesday, February 14th at noon is Public Works and at 3.30 is the Finance Committee. Um, and uh, Thursday, February 16th is at 10.30 is Zoning Hearing Board, and at 4 p.m. is the Board of Health. That brings us to the end of our uh, agenda. Uh, any comments or announcements by members of council? Hearing none, Mr. Mayor, for your, your administration. No comment. Hearing, uh, thank you. And uh, any comments from the general public? Mr. James, how are you this evening? Please uh, state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Richard James and I live at 610 West 4th Street. I am a volunteer of the Heart of Winsport. Uh, Alice Trowbridge is the director of the program, but she, she had to run out because she had to pick up her son from soccer practice and she left it to me. Uh, so uh, first, I want to make a correction on the uh, on the time for our our, our uh, meeting on Tuesday. It's uh, uh, we need to set up the uh, the projector and everything. So it's we won't be in the room at 11:30, but the meeting doesn't actually start until noon, 12 p.m. And she gave me some notes here to to tell you it's going to be in the secular room uh, Tuesday, uh, uh, February 7th. Uh, we need, uh, we're inviting everybody here to, to uh, come and participate. Um, we need you to RSVP uh, to Stephanie Young by 12 noon tomorrow so we know how much food to buy. Um, there's going to be a, a, a brief presentation of what the heart of Williamsport is and the, our progress over the last year. Uh, we went out into the communities and talked to people. At, at uh, public events uh, like First Fridays and stuff like that. Um, we collected a lot of data and we would like to show you uh, what we've collected. Um, we want to also show you a video story of a person that uh, we uh, uh, recorded and it tells a, a, a part of her life or his life in Williamsport. 
And uh, we also want to uh, collect your own stories. So uh, if you have a, a moment at a time, we sit down with us and, and talk about what your life was like in Williamsport. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, you enjoy yourselves, have a great time, and uh, uh, have a better appreciation of uh, what the citizens uh, think about the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the general public? Sir, please uh, approach and uh, your name and address for the record, please. Good evening, Council and President. Uh, my name is Nick Cowles. I am the president of Susquehanna River Valley Mobile Food Alliance. Uh, we have a mobile food alliance that uh, we've just formed recently. And uh, our request is that we would work with the city in unity to uh, resolve some problems that have occurred with food trucks and vendors. And we would also like to uh, propose some other things like a food truck Friday, possibly. Uh, our intentions are not to harm any brick and mortar buildings uh, or businesses. Our intentions are to work with them. We have been working with several restaurants and bars in the city. Uh, we have a lot of people that are coming into town now to visit our trucks and uh, everybody's in total agreement that they do enjoy having the option of having a food truck. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing and, and I, our city is based on art. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful city. We have a lot of art, uh, the community art theater, the paintings on the walls and so forth. Our trucks are movable art. Uh, I, I think most of us are anyhow. Uh, so we would like to propose that we would work with the city council to come up with the ordinances and so forth. Uh, I've been working with, I'm also a member of another food truck alliance that's in uh, Lehigh Valley, and uh, we're adopting a lot of their bylaws and so forth. We've set standards for our members that probably are above most standards for normal food truck vendors. Uh, not all food trucks in Williamsport are members of Susquehanna. Okay, so our alliance. Uh, and our wish is to not be lumped with, you know, any, any bad influence or any bad things that are being done. Uh, other than that, I, I brought a statement tonight that I can hand you that uh, you can read over. We could get together at any time and, and discuss our input. We'll take your input. We have, we have really no objections with what you've come up with so far. We just want to be part of mm -hmm. the process. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. And thank and you just, very much. Just as a, a point of order for our process, we generally don't engage in a, a, uh, an exchange during the public comment okay. stage. But a, a one request that I would make of you is uh, uh, to provide uh, contact information for you or the organization. Okay. Um, uh, our, as you read in the paper, the, our Economic Revitalization Committee is the one reviewing um, you know, the ordinance yes. uh, connected to food trucks. And so, um, as we've discussed privately, it would be appropriate to make sure that you're aware of those meetings and invited Correct. to participate. Yeah, I apologize that we didn't have anybody here the other day. No, 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 it's, it's absolutely. But if you Correct. get us our contact information, then we'll make Perfect. sure that you're aware. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Did you want to add anything? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, any other comments from the general public? Hearing none. Uh, I have a motion to adjourn. So move. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.